you, you, you're probably aware of there's plenty of room at the front. Your choice. So Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, we are at the top of the hour, or the bottom of the hour. Yep. So, uh, hello and welcome to the, uh, to the meeting of the CBO Working Group at ITF 118. <clears throat> um, my name is Tristan Amsis, this is Barry Labour, and we will uh, guide you through this, uh, this evening. As this is an ITF meeting, the note well applies, so please be aware of any IPR and general politeness concerns. Um, you've seen this probably a few times already, um, but if there are any questions, come to us or the Ombuds team or whoever would be responsible there. Um, as we have both local and remote participants, um, please let's use the MeetAQ queue, um, but we are a sufficiently small group that if there is some direct responses, um, feel free to jump the queue if there is like a situation where a direct response makes more sense than, <clears throat> than giving a full round trip. Uh, also, please be reminded to sign in via Mitico if you're, if you're uh, local because this is replacing the blue sheets. Um, we have a rather short agenda for today. Um, first is um, me and us talking. Mm -hmm. um, then we go through the list of documents that are like not fully for discussion today, but more um, we, we want to have everyone on board with the status they're in. We'll have two presentations on Pact Tibor and on uh, one of its, or, um, one possible application of it being uh, the DNS format for Cibor. And then I've prepared a short summary of the discussions that are going on and the developments on uh, deterministic profiles for which we should have enough time to um, continue with a bit discussion uh, starting from that. And dates for interim calls are throughout the ITF are um, more for, for the AOB section. Uh, so first question, is there anything that we should add or remove or alter on this agenda? Uh, here again, there's one thing that I um, would like to point out briefly. Um, that is that uh, JSON NTV um, has been uh, discussed in dispatch. And while it has not been dispatched in our direction, um, this is some, there is a thread on the mailing list um, on this. And please have a look at this and see whether there's like any input that this working group can give. Because I think there, are, there is good expertise in the, in the general topic here. Uh, Donald? Uh, hi, it's Donald East Lake from Future. I just wanted to mention that RFC 7042 BIS has actually gone to the RFC editor and it defines uh, Seaborg tags for MAC addresses and uh, OUIs. Okay, thanks. That was. I didn't have that on my screen, so good reminder. Thank you. Okay, um, that being said, uh, on the documents. Um, time tag um, used to have a discuss until today. Um, thanks to the dash 12 that has been uploaded, um, that is now saying that RFC required and expert review interact the way that both need to be present. Uh, this discuss has been cleared now. So the data lag tracker is looking green and I think this is on, the, on a good track for, for progressing through the, through the course of events. Um, on EDN lit on uh, Francesco. Yes, uh, Murray has cleared his last or the last blocking comment. So I just need to take a quick look and then I can press the button and it's done. Awesome, thank you. Um, we have a working group last call that was supposed to, uh, Carsten, sorry. Uh, that, that was supposed to, to end um, like yesterday or today on EDN literals and the update to the CDDL grammar. Um, I've, have, I've not heard anything on the mailing list um, on either of those. And given that the last thing I've heard on update 8610 grammar on the list um, or basically anything that I've heard other than mm-hmm, um, during interims, 
I'd like to extend, and uh, I'd like, uh, sorry, the last I've heard was the adoption call. I'd like to extend this working group last call for one more week and urge the working group to send feedback there. And this doesn't need to be a full, like um, several components review going through all this and this and that. If you've looked at it and you think that it is important and it's done, um, a two or three line mail will be all that we need from a few people. And then we can be more confident in making sure that this is the consensus of the group. Yeah, Justin? if uh, somebody needs help with that, I have some slides on that that okay. I would like to show in a minute Do or two. Much appreciated. Um, yeah, um, speaking of um, individual slides, um, let's do a real change here. Change deck to cheers okay. lights. Um, Shall I? Uh, we yeah yeah just plug yes yeah, just plug it in here and okay. we'll, chances are it works. Ah, wrong deck. Sorry. Okay, so for those who forgot their reading glasses, um, this is the CBA meeting. <laughs> and um, I have uh, <clears throat> three items I have prepared slides for. So I think the sequence in the agenda is slightly different, but uh, we can go back to these slides when we need to. Um, so um, let's do the Indian literal city uh, grammar thing uh, first. So I'm repeating this slide each time I'm standing here. Um, CBO is a representation format. It's not a language, it's a format. And uh, we have two associated languages to make our life easier. And one is the diagnostic notation, which is just a human readable form of talking about SIBO. And that happens to have the property that every JSON text also is a valid piece of SIBO diagnostic notation, which gives you some reasonable SIBO approximation of what is in the JSON text, but all the other things that uh, SIBO can do um, also can be done in that. And also we try to make SIBO diagnostic notation more useful for human work uh, than JSON is. So that's one thing. This thing is derived from JSON, obviously, because every JSON instance is a JSON, is a SIBO diagnostic notation instance as well. The other one is a language for specification and validation of CBO instances. So some people call these schema languages. My pre preferred term would be data definition language, um, but that's essentially the same thing. And the point is that this does not describe a single instance. Well, you can write CDL that describes a single instance, but that's not the intended usage. Uh, but the intended usage is to define uh, a set of instances, a data model uh, with that. And essentially it's a grammar language. So uh, we needed something to, to steal the overall syntax from, and we went with ABNF. So CDDL is based on ABNF, um, and it actually can describe uh, JSON and CBO in the version that's standardized, and I actually have a document that shows you how to describe CSV files with that um, as well. But that's not standardized. That's just an individual draft uh, at the moment. So that's the background. And uh, the working last calls uh, had two drafts. Um, one was the EDN literals draft that started out as a small draft just defining literals, application specific literals for diagnostic notation. I'm using the term EDN because it's shorter than diagnostic notation. Um, and uh, it turned out people wanted some things in there and it grew and it grew. And um, it is now a full specification of EDN, which we avoided when we defined CBO because we wanted to make clear this is not the interchange format. The interchange format is this binary thing. And uh, use this, this diagnostic notation if you are doing diagnostics, if you're debugging things, if you're putting up stuff on whiteboards and slides and, and so on. That's what. Uh, EDN is for, but it turns out we do use whiteboards and slides a lot, so it makes sense to um, actually make this fit for interoperation between tools 
many many of us have uh, uh, um, EBN in our CI pipelines when generating documents and, and uh, generating implementations of them. So it really makes sense to work a little bit on the interoperability of that format as well. So th this is what this document does. And it provides an ABNF grammar. And um, I actually have an implementation that directly uses that ABNF grammar. So the, the grammar is actually, um, to a certain extent, verified. I don't have all the EDN instances out there in the wild, but uh, if, if you want me to check one, send me one, and I'll do that. So that's this document. And that has been recently completed. I got a lot of feedback before the working group last call. So I'm not surprised that there's not a lot coming in during the working group last call. Uh, but uh, please do have a look at it. There's always things get, that can be done better. The other one is the update 8610 grammar. And I probably should have used CDDL in the title and not 8610. Um, so CDDL was defined with an ABNF in the original document in, in 8610, uh, but we made some mistakes. And uh, this document in particular addresses three errata reports and has some, some minor other fixes, some of which are quite useful in conjunction with the CDDL2 CDDL uh, work. So this would be a good time to close the thing and uh, be done with it. So the, the explicit job of the update 8610 document is to update RFC 8610 and make it fit uh, for the next round and get rid of the errata. Um, so that, that's mainly what I wanted um, to say, just as a... Sorry. You, yeah, that? sorry. Wrong focus. <laughs> Perfect. So, <clears throat> whoops. Uh, let's keep one. Um, yeah, so um, I think that's what I just said without the slide. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, update 8610 grammar is, is kind of, it would be nice to finish this now so we can put CDL2 on top of that. EDN literates is not urgent. But the problem with things that are not urgent in the ITF that is, is that they never get done. And uh, Let's try to finish it this year. Um, so just as a random idea for the next round, uh, EDN Literates comes with a registry for application types. And I just want to uh, um, initiate a process in your mind. Uh, we just were in a COSI working group meeting. And people, of course, had lots of EDN, uh, EDN uh, uh, examples on their slides. And uh, typically these examples used text strings where they really meant uh, enumeration values that stand for these text strings. So one um, application specific literal that we could define if we want to um, is something called E or enum, E for enum, uh, that you can write to express um, I'm using the text form here, but really think the enum value that we have assigned to that. So th this is not useful for, for actually processing this piece of uh, diagnostic notation, unless you have a little cheat table at the side, um, but it's still useful as a slide notation. So if you want to make a slide and just don't know what number is going to be there, uh, put it with the E, um, application specific um, extension and be done with this. Now, the nice thing is this is a registry, so I can just write up a short document. Um, well, first I have to find a designated expert for that, but once that is done, <laughs> I can write up a short document um, and uh, this becomes part of, of EDN. Um, uh, so yeah, just, just as an example of what we can do with uh, EDN if we want to. Okay, I think that's about all I wanted to say. Um, so that would mean that we would ask the next, like ask for questions here and then go for the next speaker. So please don't walk away. <laughs> um, questions, comments? Not everyone at once. 
Okay. Yep, so thanks for the update there. Um, and then I'd say let's move to the next block, which is um, Pact Tibo. Okay. You do have slides, okay. Okay, Seaball Package. Uh, we have been working on this for a couple of years and uh, we haven't had a lot of discussion in the working group uh, around this, but we have had a lot of discussion um, in various fora in, in the GitHub repositories um, uh, and so on. Um, this is not quite ready for working group last call, but getting uh, close. So let me quickly explain what Seaball Pact is. Um, when we started out the CBOR work, everybody told us, why don't you use compressed JSON? And uh, well, the answer was it doesn't have the data types we need. But the other answer is that doing something inefficiently and then it, it, applying compression to it to, to getting it smaller, that, that's not necessarily something that your temperature sensor wants to do. Um, so that's why CBOR was created. Uh, but we still have some redundancy um, in CBO data items. And making use of this uh, redundancy um, is, is a very good thing. So uh, we looked at packing CBO, which is not the standard text-based compression, but it really is meant to allow in-place use of a packed CBO data item from an application. So the, all this structure uh, really stays uh, directly usable. Um, it just has a few pointers that no longer make it an actual tree. It's more like a, direct, a directed acyclic uh, graph. So to do this, um, we have two uh, re relatively well separated elements. One is building reference tables so that, that those pointers actually point into a table. And um, these tables need to be built. And the second one is referencing things from the table in a packed or rump document, uh, as we call it, that we send uh, together uh, with information about uh, the tables. Now, the uh, packed uh, referencing, that is pretty much ready. We haven't had a lot of um, change there recently. And it seems this works. It does have a few innovations. These function tags are something that nobody has done before in, in this way. Um, and it's actually an extension point. So like we can add extension to EDN later, we will be able to put things into the reference uh, set uh, later. And what the, the reference set um, assumes to find in the tables is share I shared items. These are complete data items that are shared, they are, that are used at multiple places um, in uh, the SIBO data item, and argument items, usually for concatenation. But there are other operations you may want to do with an argument uh, item. And what the, the uh, draft mostly does is it reserves, it makes IANA registrations for reserved uh, values, or for assigned values. Uh, that can be used to do these references. So the simple values 0 to 15 are essentially pointers into the, the shared item set. Um, tag 6 is a pointer into a shared item if it's used with an integer. It's an argument item when it's used with something else. And then you can you see the numbers uh, uh, on the slides. Um, so the, the, there is a limited set of tags that, that is being um, allocated, but uh, the set, because the, the tag um, namespace is uh, 64 bits, of course, we can provide a lot of them. Uh, it's very unlikely that somebody will actually use tag 28704, uh, but um, it, it's there to avoid artificial limitations. And finally, we have the function tags, which do something interesting that, that you can uh, look up. And the other part is this number one in the list I just had, the table building. And that table building is likely to be rather application specific. So uh, about 20 years ago, I worked on a, a table for a constant table that was written up in an RFC uh, for SIP. 
So the, the, the SIP protocol, the chatty text protocol, and if you want to run this over tight air interfaces, you want to compress it. And um, we had a, a static RFC-defined table for that. Um, so building tables is, is an interesting process that can be done ahead of time. Uh, then you would ha just have a reference to such a table in your document, for instance, by using a tag, the definition of which says use this table. Um, or you can uh, put the table into the data item together with the rump, uh, with the part that does the, the table references. And to, to make pseudo-pack useful right away, the batteries included uh, concept, um, we just put in two tags here that do, do a simple basic table setup and a split basic table uh, setup. You can look up the details um, in the document. Um, so this is not meant to be uh, the, the end or be all of, of table setup mechanisms. And uh, what, what we are discussing in, in the DNS CBO discussion right now, what is the best way to actually um, do the table uh, building in that um, environment? So I don't even expect that the majority of the CBO pack user, uh, users in the future will use this simple uh, basic uh, setup, but uh, maybe something application specific. And we can do innovations there as well. I think that that's more potential for innovations in the table building than in the table reference. Um, so two innovations that, that we'll discuss uh, later when we talk about DNS Cibo. Um, one is that uh, we can do implicit table building, which means uh, we actually examine the rump for information that leads to building uh, the table. Instead of explicitly say, here is the thing that goes into the table. And the other innovation is incremental table building, uh, which is not really an innovation at all because tags 256 and 25 did, did this right in 2014, um, but they, they, they have this little problem. Uh, so the idea about incremental table building is that uh, you have a process that actually goes through the content of the data item once in one single pass and while you are running through this in, in this pass, uh, you build your table. So, you, so whatever you put in your table when you find useful stuff can be used after that, but not before that. Uh, which when you share data items is an obvious thing because the first time you, you mentioned the shared data item, it goes into the table. Um, so tags 256 and 25 already did this specifically for strings, text strings. Um, but there is a problem here in that CBO maps don't have a defined document order. So this word after that I, I put in there in the slide actually has a pretty complicated semantics. So something is after something else. If all potential map orderings that you, your uh, CBO parser might be looking at this with um, generate the same result. And that, that sometimes hurts. So we, we have to look at this one solution is to not use maps, then this works perfectly. Um, but maybe we have to say something about what happens when we do use uh, maps. Um, so my plan is, oh, I forgot to send you the new slides. There's a fourth item in the plan. Um, the fourth <laughs> item is there are still three outstanding mails in, in the, uh, working group mail repository that have some detailed comments that we have to process. One for, from Bert Harris, one from Maria, she has a Czech last name that I can't remember, and one from Christian Andres. And um, yeah, these need to be looked at. Um, we, we need to look at benchmarks like this DNS and CBO, but maybe we have some other applications where, which we can throw into a CBO uh, pack and see how, how well that uh, works. And of course, it would be nice to get some more uh, implementer uh, feedback. But I think in the end, we should decide on a time box uh, with this. We, we essentially have been doing this for a year um, already. We probably should decide to, to end this at some point um, and uh, maybe have a W, uh, W plus call um, 
capable version at some time before uh, next ITF. So we will have finished the work on this by, by that ITF. So that would be my proposal to do a time loss. Comments? Yeah, thank you. Um, I do have a comment from a, from a participant point of view. Um, so you mentioned the trouble with maps. Um, if, the, if the application prescribed that um, some deterministic encoding is used, um, then would it suffice if the, if the processor just checked that it's indeed deterministic and can then use, this, use the, as the, in, the in serialization uh, sequence? Sounds good to me. Questions, comments, suggestions on the time frame? Um, hearing none. Um, let's. let's hmm, sorry. Okay. That's good. That's good input. Thank you. That was all good. Um, okay. So then let's switch over to the next item. Which is? Uh, which is a Martinez. Um, presentation on, DN on uh, the DNS format for Cibor. Oh, could have done this right away. <clears throat> um, do you want, uh, right, great. No, it's great because this frees up my mouse pointer and okay. I can have a better look at, to the, into the minutes, okay. which uh, Michael is uh, writing. Thanks for that. Okay. Anyway. Um, yeah, I, Martin Lenders, thank you for the introduction. Um, and I talk about DNS CBOR, or as we call it, the draft, a concise binary representation of DNS messages. Um, first, I want to go into my motivation. Um, we basically, when we send uh, DNS packages, specifically in this example over co op, um, we quickly run into the problem that messages get larger than the actual link layer PDU. So we want to get them somehow a little bit smaller. And so a concise DNS messages format is needed and this is what I'm talking about. Uh, the objectives of our format are that we provide a concise packet format and compress names and addresses in the DNS queries and replies. And um, for that we want to of course use an existing implementation which is CBOR and encode these DNS messages in CBOR. Then we want to also omit DNS fields and in the DNS queries and responses to achieve more concise, even more conciseness and uh, address uh, the name compression using CBOR pack, which was presented in the slide set before by Carsten. Um, so what do I mean with omitting DNS fields? If we look at your typical query, we have a lot of fields in there, uh, which for some, if we use something like DNS over co-op or DNS over HTTPS, we don't need, or if we encode something in CBOR, we don't need specifically because the encoding allows for them uh, already. And this is uh, the transaction IDs and the count fields, uh, the count fields specifically because we only have always one question in the typical DNS message. Uh, we don't need at all uh, most of the cases in the question in the query at least. Um, and then we also have the flags which are oftentimes no null or zero or something uh, that is not needed for the DNS over the co-ops. Um, so we can also omit them. And then we also can because most queries are for the internet class uh, omit that and also the query type which is in this case an address record uh, query and this is most of the traffic so we basically just have the name and we put this to maybe add later more metadata into a, a nested array and uh, what do i mean by that for example if uh, we still want to for example query an a record we just append this to the list. Or if we want to ask for a different class, we just append this to the list again. And for the outer list, we can, for example, use if we still want to use flags or we want to add additional resource records, for example, for options, then we can use that. And for the response, uh, we basically also can ignore all the stuff that we used for the, uh, already ignored for the query, query format. Oh, sorry. 
Um, and uh, we also uh, can omit the uh, this in the responses as well, of course. And we also can omit the names because uh, we because we have used DNS over co-op and DNS over HTTPS, we can map the queries to the responses. And so we don't uh, need the name actually because we have this information somewhere in our transfer protocol already. And the length again, because of the co encoding of SIBO, we don't need. And this leaves us just with the TTL and the R data. And if we need, for example, the question section still, we just can prepend it or append the other sections if needed. So uh, what changed since the last ITF 117 and version three of the draft? We added a note on the representation of more structured R data. So if we don't use binary uh, representations or stuff like that, uh, we provided a format descriptor for uh, EDNS option record, pseudo records, added an implementation section, um, simplified the CDDL uh, for, to a more idiomatic style and did other cleanups and housekeeping and removed the DNS transaction ID because as I said previously, we don't actually need it. And there was also in a previous version, the representation of our data in a, as an int, but that basically that just led to more problems than uh, was really necessary. So uh, I decided to remove that. Uh, yeah, I also talked about option pseudo record as uh, something that was added. This basically allows us to put a tag around a list, and this is then an, with, with 141, and this is then an option record, um, and we gain a lot of uh, bytes uh, out compared to the wire format uh, out of that. Uh, we then did some evaluation on our uh, stuff already um, on, on the definitions up until now. And uh, yeah, uh, these, we use some data sets for that, which were collected throughout 2019 and consumed the number of IoT devices. You can uh, see all the numbers up there. And uh, through our implementation on that, uh, which we did last hackathon at the ITF 117 and uh, put it unpacked and packed into that. And then looked at a relative measure with a compression ratio and an absolute measure with the byte savings. And there we can see these uh, cumulative uh, distributive functions. So on the x-axis, you see both measures and uh, then the uh, cumulative distributive uh, distribution on the y-axis. And uh, you see that for the relative measures, we have this long tail in the, uh, in, in the positive direction. and this long tail in the absolute measure for the byte savings. So what uh, is the uh, thing there? Uh, for the compression ratio, actually, um, this is uh, just an empty response. Uh, so uh, we basically threw everything away except in this case the flags and then added some empty lists. Um, for, and this is also why the uh, unpacked format is larger as smaller here than the pack format because we add this extra list for the uh, packing table in front. And for the uh, byte savings, on the other hand, for where we have this huge losses compared to the classic DNS format, is because uh, it contains a lot of, lot of names and we only uh, decided to, to use name compression with packed. So uh, yeah, we lose a lot of bytes. So we came to the conclusion we need some name compression for the base format. So what are our uh, choices there? Uh, we can keep the names uncompressed as we decided before. Uh, we can use a bespoke DNS solution or we can use an existing solution with SIBO packed and just say, okay, we don't make SIBO packed optional or use a, uh, some uh, special solution for DNS base format uh, from, of packed. And that is basically the, the ideas we discussed at the last interim. Uh, first, the classic DNS format style, basically, where we reference the name components within the Seaboard object and the Seaboard pack light, where we reference just the name prefixes in a predefined table. Uh, and just to give you an example, what I mean by that, uh, I took a pointer record uh, request for example.org, which you also find as an example in our draft. Uh, where we basically have a question for the pointer record, which is type 12, um, and get uh, the pointer back in the answer section, then some name servers in uh, the uh, authority section, 
and the uh, uh, a quad A records in the additional section. And if you look at this, at the first idea, which was loosely based on an idea by Christian to split up the domain name into components instead of the text string, uh, like it is done in the CRI format in uh, core, uh, we can uh, then uh, use these componentified names to add a tag in, in the name, which we then use as a reference. Uh, what is still to be decided to be decided what type of tag we use if we use in one one of the rare one plus one uh, zero bytes uh, we get a two byte reference similar to dns or we use a larger tag but then the basically the semantics of this tag is that we start at a name component from the e string and then uh, stop if the object is neither a string anymore or nor the tag. And if we have a tag, we just follow it until there's nothing else to consume. And uh, basically from the example I give, gave before, we, this would look something like this. And you always have to somewhat keep this implicit table in mind then, um, where basically now NS1 is, uh, in this one exact.example.org is now encoded as one as one tag zero. So it references the zeros entry into this implicit table. And so it ns one example.org, just to give an example. Um, and as Carsten already pointed out, this could be somewhat seen as a variant of pack CBO with implicit table building and an alternative reference syntax and semantics. Um, and then the other idea was basically use what we already have with CBOR pack just in a light version where um, we basically just use the strings for CBOR pack and not the bytes and not the values, uh, other values. Um, and uh, there the object would look something like this. Um, so uh, we have our uh, argument table in front or the shared value table which uh, then is referenced by, but with a simple value within the object. Um, so uh, we then threw again our implementation and data set on that for as we use for our implementation and used uh, some the improvement or it's again the old slide <laughs> that I just noticed. Um, uh, just think of the line of the x axis as percentages um, uh, just take it by 100 in, in the newer version of this was percent actually. Um, yeah, uh, anyway, um, yeah, we, we used this improvement factor then as uh, to compare it. And for that, we saw that over 70% of the responses without the questions gained an improvement of over 0%. So it was better than the uh, component referencing. And uh, for the improvement that was smaller than 0%, it was mostly overhead due to the extra list. So this is just an implementation issue and not the problem of the format. Um, yeah, uh, but in general, of, of course, you should note this is just for the data set we used. So more research is needed there. <laughs> so in conclusion, uh, with the name compression I presented here, in both cases, we can uh, lead to an compression ratio of over 100% for nearly all uh, responses. and for the ones that is not that, that they are not um, it is negligible or uh, solved by an implementation fix. Um, both formats have their benefits. Uh, the component referencing is more concise because we don't need an extra. Uh, hmm? I, I wasn't aware that this was acting immediately as I refreshed your slides. So okay. <laughs> um, sorry. Do I know? Can control them again? Um, yep. Um, I... <laughs> Doesn't seem like it. Yeah, and I can't. I'm not sure I can. Okay then. Okay, I'll. <clears throat> can Can you request again? Yeah. And I'll jump you to the end. Okay. Oh, no, I can. I can do that. Sorry. Can I? I don't know. <clears throat> need to progress to the very end again. Okay. 
Okay, uh, so uh, the benefit of uh, component referencing is <coughs> that it is more concise because it doesn't add any byte overhead to the, to the extra list. It is simpler to implement because we don't have to count the occurrences. We just build basically the implicit table while we are scanning. Um, it is more familiar to DNS implementers because it is more similar to the classic DNS uh, name compression. And the benefits of Pack Lite is that it's, on the other hand, more familiar to CBOR implementers, and uh, it doesn't need any new definitions of a reference syntax or a new table building uh, mechanism, and just uses what is defined in the CBOR Pack draft. And it is more efficient when it comes to the uh, bytes actually sent over the wire, because more of the responses we saw uh, were made smaller compared to component referencing. So the question I have to the working group is basically which way should we go or do you maybe also have any other ideas? And as Kasten proposed, maybe we should also think about having the implicit table building for CBO Pact in general. Thank you. Thank you. So what is the way? <laughs> yeah, first of all, thank you. That, that is exactly the kind of work we, we need in this uh, working group to make good uh, decisions. Uh, Christian, if you can go back to slide 42, oh, yeah. 42, which has the number 14 on it. Mm, mm, um, yes. Mm. So, let me take a back. Yeah, that was it. Exactly. Um, so I think that this, this is a really good way to uh, think about that. So uh, the, the implementation has this implicit uh, table in mind. Um, and that actually looks a lot like the, the normal CBO packed uh, tables. And the only thing we would really need to add uh, to CBO packed is a slicing reference. So you, you may not be aware what, what, uh, uh, what the word slicing means here, but um, there are various programming languages, Clojure, for instance, or Scheme, uh, that, that have a way where you can insert a variable that is an array uh, into a literal that is becoming an array and essentially splice the thing. So you are not putting an array into the array, but you're unpacking the array into the, the newly created array. And that, that's pretty much what's happening uh, here. So maybe we should just think about adding a, a slicing reference to, to CBO Pact, and uh, also um, about uh, having some text about the implicit, and this actually is incremental as well, uh, incremental uh, table, table building uh, processes, so so you can just use these words instead of defining uh, them um, for this specific application. But apart from that, this is really great. Um, of course, I'm I'm uh, <laughs> petting myself here a little bit, but um, of course the, the the work always is done by the bright young grad student and not not by uh, the, the people supervising that work. Uh, so thank you. Um, so what did I want to say? Um, brief, oh. quest, brief question from, for clarification. Yes. Um, <clears throat> are you saying that um, with subtle extensions to packed, basically what is shown on the screen could just be packed? Yes. OK, thank you. Okay. So uh, I, the one thing I want to say is that um, these, these um, beautiful CDF um, cumulative distribution function um, graphs, of course, are based on the corpus of uh, DNS messages. Um, and as always in these papers, the, uh, what we have can be debated. And uh, a typical issue um, in, in the ones we have is that they are taken uh, from some form of implementation, usually some, some lab um, implementation. 
Um, and uh, yes, it's, it's a million DNS packets, but it's a million DNS packets that are essentially all coming from the same application, the same uh, uh, software running everywhere and so on. So um, th these numbers are not perfect, perfectly uh, valid. They, they have a limited um, uh, quality of expression. So getting more uh, data like this would be really useful. So if anybody here is in the room and has some captured uh, DNS data, we really would like to talk to you. Yes. Thanks. Okay, any questions? Donald? Uh, this is Donald Eastlake from Future Way. Uh, this may not be a problem, but I just wanted to be sure you're aware that DNS names are binary clean. And DNS labels can contain a literal period that doesn't separate labels and contain zero bytes and bytes that are all ones and stuff like that. And that your user interface may die and fall over, but the DNS protocol is perfectly happy with that. And um, that's actually the reason why Christians proposed to uh, uh, componify the name in uh, the SIBO format. Okay. Yeah. So maybe this idea is the better idea than the idea to. Hi, yeah. I don't see a button here on my interface to put myself in the queue. So. <laughs> Just the DNA place in that, in that So I'm Esko Dijk. <laughs> anyway, I'm just thinking about the request for examples. I actually can uh, get some examples where the query count is uh, greater than one. The, mm -hmm. Those are interesting because I don't think they fit in this format. And it's also going uh, kind of out of specification because there has have been recent debates about that. Well, we don't. We're not going to support query count greater than one. Uh, mm. So, but there are actually implementations that I work with that do use it, uh, and they have a fallback to, to query count one if they notice that query count greater than one is not supported. So that's a bit hacky, all of that, but it exists. I just want. To yeah, I that. followed this work very roughly also on the DN. I think DNS op list. There was a lot larger discussion about this topic. Um, yeah. yeah, this is probably something we need to think about. I'm not sure about the use case you're using at the moment. So if there is a valid use case for the domain, we plan to use this format and we of course need to adapt for this. But, yeah. yeah, actually the, the use case, it was already uh, kind of pre-decided in, in a side meeting uh, yesterday that there was actually a better way of doing it. So I think the use case was to request uh, an additional uh, record like a uh, server record and the text record for the same name. And we agreed that that's maybe better done with uh, using an EDNS option that you add, like say flagging, okay, I want these additional types for the same name. And, and that has some better properties, especially the handling by, by legacy receivers that don't know the multiple yes. questions Can, thing. I, I, I'd like to suggest that we take that offline because we yep. are running into the into the last quarter, into, into the last twelve minutes, and okay. I'd like to um, make some progress on the on the pack format as well. Agreed. But yeah. I hope that was the last comment from the room. So, and, and any any more, please send them to the list. Okay. And thanks for thanks for Thank showing you. us. Um, I'll go back to the chair slides briefly because this is a. Um, this has been a topic that has seen, uh, seen um, quite a few mailing list threads, and I'd like to summarize a bit here before we get into, um, before I give the floor to Carsten, who has prepared slides here. Um, so the, um, this, this all started from the requirements of, of, the, uh, um, of the Gordian project. Um, it is now well understood that the problem space we are dealing with here is can be split into two, which has been reflected in the latest uploads from Carsten's documents, that one, we need to do deterministic CBOR encoding in a way that it is not just guidance with a few suggestions of what the application should do, but like um, had, has at least one profile. And the other is addressing the remaining requirements of Gordian about numeric reduction and removing a few other um, items that can be around. Um, the controversial topic there is around it, which it centers is uh, like, um, is the integer two the same as the float two? 
Um, but that is a pr question probably better left to, to philosophical discussion because the, there's the underlying question of what does the serializer and deserializer need to know about this? Um, yeah. Um, Anders is, as I understand, um, um, giving, giving this a, some, some practical experimentation. Uh, there's one more controversial topic that is like what precisely, um, what precisely is supposed to be in the DC war in terms of like how strict should this be, how extensible should this should be. So currently there is, there are two documents from Carsten on CDE and, and DC war sitting on top of it. And there's a document from Wolf that is the original Say the original um, description of DC war, including both. Um, my hope is that those two authors will um, collaborate into one document. I think that is a work in progress. Um, so, uh, Carsten, you have slides on that. I'll just switch over to those. And Wolf, I hope to hear from you as well. Okay. Ah, sorry. <laughs> so, is, is two the same thing as 2.0? That depends. And uh, it depends on the application. And that's why it's, uh, it has been such a move forward to find out that DC Bore really is an application profile because it's, it's exactly the right thing for, for this kind of application. But there are other applications where floating point numbers are inexact numbers, that, that, which may not be category that, that is known to a lot of people, but uh, it, it's a very valid way to actually operate with numbers. And then they are not the same. Um, so I think it's good that we say it's an application profile that equates two with 2.0 and the, the basic model is not trying to do that. And we tried to do this in 2013 and got, got a lot of flack <laughs> for doing that. So I'm not going, I'm not proposing to repeat that experience. Yeah, and, and while we're waiting for the slides to come up, um, the, the part about extensibility in, in my DC ball uh, draft really are thought experiments. So they don't have to be part of the final specification because the specification is not making those extensions. Um, but I think it was good uh, to, to look at those thought experiments and see that they don't cause some, some any unwarranted uh, confusion or complexity. Okay, just to, to uh, say what, um, th there is a, a yeah, um, Rufus on the, in the queue. Yeah, um, yep, um, well, just Wolf, Wolf, please. Hi, uh, Wolf McNally, Blockchain Commons. And uh, I just wanted to say that the, the, you know, the philosophical question of is two equal to uh, floating point two, you know, isn't relevant to most people and shouldn't be. And um, CBOR is, you know, fine as it is when it comes to the way it represents things. Um, and uh, the goal of DCBOR is a bit different in that it's trying to uh, address a specific kind of problem space. Um, and uh, the numeric reduction of DCBOR is um, one of our, uh, you know, initiatives to do that in that problem space, which is to um, uh, take things that are semantically equivalent and give them equivalent encodings uh, or, or identical encodings. And, um, you know, that is not one size fits all. Um, it's never been a proposal that it kind of become the standard in the Seaboard community, uh, but um, it has proven its utility in our own work. And I think that the community could benefit from it as well. So, um, and I agree with Karsten that the, um, that DC bore uh, is a profile of now CDE, uh, which is uh, which is on top of CBOR, and uh, and that we should merge our documents, um, and uh, um, you know, uh, uh, in general, I, I like the direction that uh, that we're taking this, and I would like to also see uh, DC bore at some point uh, be on the standards track. So that's all I have to say at the moment. Okay, thank you. Um, so just to, to remind you of what the underlying problem is, uh, deterministic encoding is a way to make sure that the same data are encoded the same way by everybody like DER for ASM1, if you remember that one. And um, there is um, a spectrum between things that the generic encoder can do and the application actually needs to do. So the application has to make up their mind of 
how they do their floating point commutations and how they represent times and all this stuff. So this, this cannot be done by the deterministic encoding mechanism in the generic encoder. So 8949 left a number of details to the application and didn't quite get the cut right there between the things that were left to the application and that, that really should be part of the, the fundamental uh, uh, functionality. Um, so the, the problem is that people who write generic encoders these days don't have quite the guidance they need to put a deterministic encoding function um, into this. And this, uh, again, leads users of those libraries to think that the uh, de deterministic encoding mechanism of CBOR is not well-defined, uh, which it is, but it leaves some things to the application and uh, we, we need to fix that. So the, the idea is to uh, write a common deterministic encoding profile, uh, or CDE in short, that nails this down in a way that is compatible with most reasonable application profiles. I mean, sure, um, yes, there, there may be ex uh, exceptions, uh, but uh, we believe this, this covers not 80%, but more like 99%. Um, of all applications. And uh, this document, with, which I, a draft for which I submitted uh, during this meeting, um, this also defines the term application profile and, and DCBOR would actually be one of these application profiles. I don't expect there to be 10 or 100 application profiles because the, the number of various ways of looking at data is somewhat limited. But I, I mentioned the, this thing with exact and inexact numbers that, that really is very ingrained in, in some areas. So maybe there will be two, but maybe the, those people don't need one right now, so we will not get to it. So um, my plan would be uh, to be really fast in adopting the common profile um, I submitted that as a BCP just to, to get the discussion going, whether it should be the BCP or a standards um, track. I think the, the, the implementers in the end won't care, um, but still we should sort this correctly. Um, and uh, then um, I think uh, Wolf and I had a little bit of uh, exchange already uh, on how to merge the two um, DCP documents that, that we then have. Um, so I split off the, the DC ball stuff into a separate document. And of course, Wolf has one with the whole motivation and, and so on. Uh, so I, I think uh, these two documents can be merged very profitably. And we also can get rid of the extensibility aspect because that's not intended um, for uh, DC ball. So we should be able to do this in, I don't know, maybe the next month or so. It shouldn't be. Uh, too hard. And uh, then we can look at that document and uh, find out whether we want to adopt it and uh, whether we want to put it on the standard track. But the CDE document is there. It's out there. Uh, please have a look at it. Um, it's not very long because there, there isn't that much to be fixed, to be nailed down from 8949. 8949 is pretty good already. Um, so please look at that, and then we need to decide whether that's a BCP or a standard strike. That's all I have. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, there is one question that I want to add forward, like to the gen to the general room already, um, especially if, especially for those who have read the document, but also for those who have followed the discussion. Um, would you support adopt adopting this even without the uh, uh, kind of even considering that BCP or standard strike is like to be decided later? Um, I'm starting a brief utilization here. And while I'm waiting for people to oh, find the buttons, um, so um, Carsten and, and Wolf, I hope to see a document soon by which I can find out whether I can later in the data tracker um, make one document uh, replace two others. And I'll be happy to do that. Awesome. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm I'm getting I'm getting ten yeses here and and third, I'm not sure I think the thirty the twenty eight no opinion are people in the room who haven't clicked a button so that's mm -hmm. not explicit no opinion. So there are at um, least five people who didn't find the button. And... Yeah, um, but uh, like the number of yeses is still increasing at twelve. So um, 
I think we yeah. can we can we can start a call for adoption on the list and kind of go with this. Okay. 15. Still still rising. Yeah. All right. Um thank you, I think. Well let's just, just put the dates up for the ah, yeah. Terms. Good point. We still have one chair slide. For the last um yes. For the last seconds. So um yeah, um we've had interims. I think they were successful. They've also been alternating with with the core working group. Um let's keep it that way. If anyone has opinions of anything we should change there, let us know. But that's the plan. Okay. Any other business? Twenty seconds. So just in case you can't remember which week has the CBOR ones and the core ones. It's the same as everywhere. CBOR is odd. Yeah, but that, that, change, that, that, change, that changes every year. No, I said the wrong thing. <laughs> core is odd. Core is odd. CBOR is even. <laughs> which week numbers are you using? I, the ISO ones. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everyone. See you on interim and then Brisbane. I think that would be right. Yes. Right All good. And yeah, this is why this was. Yeah. Oh. You can...